Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am Zach, your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. My pronouns are he, him, and tonight I'm going to bring you another chapter, chapter two of um, Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread. Uh, we're going to learn this chapter a lot about revolution, what it's going to look like to go through it, and uh, some of the pitfalls that, that come with it. Um, so this week, uh, doing uh, a different game. Last, last week we, we tried to do Sim Tower and it, it didn't work out very well. Uh, the, the program was not great. It was very laggy and slow. Uh, not to mention it was just kind of boring. I kind of forgot how boring that game was, but you know, back in the, the 90s when it was the latest thing, I guess it was a lot more impressive. So anyway, uh, not going to uh, belabor that too much more. I think we're going to get right into the content. So uh, this is the, the latest version of, of SimCity that I have up right here right now. Uh, so that I have all the different starter packs for it, uh, including the, the Cities of Tomorrow. So as you can see, I'm uh, just about to build one of the mega towers. So we can uh, look at some interesting stuff as we uh, try and focus in on the theory that's being presented. Um, if you would like to join this, this realm that, I, that I'm building in, um, you can friend me on Origin, which is the, the uh, online platform that, that hosts uh, the newest version of SimCity. Uh, my uh, username there is Zclectic. That's Eclectic with a Z. So if you just send me a friend request, I will send you a link and you can join the region. We can, we can build a whole community of, uh, or a whole region of cities together. Uh, it'll be kind of fun. So I'll, I'm probably going to be doing this uh, particular game for the rest of the Conquest of Bread. That's, that's my plan right now. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to be a part of that, remember that's uh, Zclectic. Eclectic with a Z on the front. So just send me a friend request and we can play it together. So let's get right into the book and we will start with chapter two. I'll also note that I, we're switching narrations. Uh, there was some complaints last week about the kind of the creakiness, the graveliness of the, the voice of the person who was doing the audiobook. So I found a, a much more pleasant version to listen to. This, this, this lady has a nice, soft and clear voice. So that shouldn't be a problem this week. Uh, let me know what you think about that. I don't know if she goes all the way through all the chapters in this particular version, but we will we'll pick and choose as we go. I want you guys to have a good listening experience. I don't want you to be turned off by the 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 theory itself and the, the people who are presenting it or because of the people who are presenting it. That's that's not my intention at all. It's not good for anybody. So we're going to go ahead and start with the audio now. Chapter 2, Conquest of Bread. Let's do it. Chapter 2 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2, Well-Being for All, Part 1 Well-being for all is not a dream. It is possible, realizable, owing to all that our ancestors have done to increase our powers of production. We know, indeed, that the producers, although they constitute hardly one-third of the inhabitants of civilized countries, even now produce such quantities of goods that a certain degree of comfort could be brought to every hearth. We know further that if all those who squander today the fruits of others' toil were forced to employ their leisure in useful work, our wealth would increase in proportion to the number of producers and more. Finally, we know that contrary to the theory enunciated by Malthus, the oracle of middle-class economics, the productive powers of the human race increase at a much more rapid ratio than its powers of reproduction. The more thickly men are crowded on the soil, the more rapid is the growth of their wealth-creating power. Thus, although the population of England has only increased from 1844 to 1890 by 62%, its production has grown, to say the least, at double that rate, to wit, by 130%. In France, where the population has grown more slowly, the increase in production is nevertheless very rapid. Notwithstanding the crises through which agriculture is frequently passing, notwithstanding state interference, the blood tax, conscription, and speculative commerce and finance, the production of wheat in France has increased fourfold, and industrial production more than tenfold, in the course of the last 80 years. In the United States, the progress is still more striking. 
In spite of immigration, or rather precisely because of the influx of surplus European labor, the United States have multiplied their wealth tenfold. However, these figures give yet a very faint idea of what our wealth might become under better conditions. For alongside of the rapid development of our wealth-producing powers, we have an overwhelming increase in the ranks of the idlers and middlemen. Instead of capital gradually concentrating itself in a few hands so that it would only be necessary for the community to dispossess a few millionaires and enter upon its lawful heritage, instead of the socialist forecast proving true, the exact reverse is coming to pass. The swarm of parasites is ever increasing. In France, there are not 10 actual producers to every 30 inhabitants. The whole agricultural wealth of the country is the work of less than 7 millions of men, and in the two great industries, mining and the textile trade, you will find that the workers number less than two and one half millions. But the exploiters of labor, how many are they? In England, exclusive of Scotland and Ireland, only one million workers, men, women, and children, are employed in all the textile trades. Rather more than half a million work the mines, rather less than half a million till the ground, and the statisticians have to exaggerate all the figures in order to establish a maximum of 8 million producers to 26 million inhabitants. What Kropotkin was talking about here is the uh, the tendency of automation and you know, increased efficiencies in labors you know, destroying jobs overall, the jobs at the bottom. It's a, it's a trend that we're seeing continue on today um, through especially in the, in the fields that you talked about, agriculture and mining and stuff like that. We see greater and greater automation, which on the one hand is good. There's a lot of dangerous and, and very difficult jobs that have been taken over by machines. So that's in, on the one hand a good thing. But on the other hand, it, it, it's putting people in more and more of a precarious position uh, to the point where we're headed towards uh, a major crisis, it looks like. A lot of people are starting to talk about things like UBI, uh, giving people just a basic living wage because there's just not going to be enough low level what they tend to call unskilled which is really just a pejorative in my mind but unskilled jobs um just so that people have something to do if there's you know, or some, some way to subsist if there's uh such a drastic decrease through automation especially like think if um the transportation sector really got to be automated with, with self-driving cars like how much uh, the transportation sector is a very large sector uh, of the economy and just imagine how many jobs would be lost if if all the truckers were gone all the taxi people all the delivery people all that sort of thing was just outsourced to machines in essence Um, so interesting to see those historical connections playing out even on a greater scale today strictly speaking the creators of the goods exported from britain to all the ends of the earth comprise only from six to seven million workers And what is the sum of the shareholders and middlemen who levy the first fruits of labor from far and near and heap up unearned gains by thrusting themselves between the producer and the consumer, paying the former not a fifth, nay, not a twentieth, of the price they exact from the latter? Nor is this all. Those who withhold capital constantly reduce the output by restraining production. Mm. We need... Mm. Uh, Yeah, that's another important part. uh, It's the idea of having to create an artificial scarcity, something you see all the time in the market, um, creating an artificial scarcity in order to boost the price back up. Otherwise, you don't end up making a profit. I would imagine if instead we had a system where money was not a factor, where need was the driving force, you know. So instead of uh, farmers letting crops rot in the field because they couldn't get a good price for it, people dumping milk out or, or... yeah, you know, think even of a, a restaurant not throwing away all its food at the end of the day or a bakery or something like that, but instead giving it to the people based on their needs. Uh, just think of how different a system that would be and how much more needs we could meet if we weren't always uh, putting profit at the, at the top. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, he was talking re- in the last couple of seconds too about um owners taking most of the profit for themselves like uh if you ever worked a fast food job and you've really kept track of of the till uh, think about how much you've been making per hour versus how much the company has been taking in and yeah it's, it's gross revenue there's definitely operating expenses to be accounted for but uh just for a small example i used to work for panera bread i worked 
there for um, two and a half, three years, something like that. And my managers would talk about how in a good morning, like this is just the morning rush up until lunchtime, uh, they wanted to be on track to be bringing in something like $35,000 in sales every morning. And there would be maybe a dozen of us on staff. So just think about the disparity between the few hundreds of dollars, potentially maybe even a couple hundred, two, three hundred dollars that they're paying out. Because this was almost a minimum wage job back when I was working at it. Uh, I think I was pulling in eight fifty nine dollars an hour. Um, and this was this was like 10 or so, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but anyway, so just a few dollars go to the, the actual people doing the work of, of baking and preparing and uh, doing cash register, cleaning, all the, all the stuff that actually is the lifeblood of the, the company. And here the company's grossing $35,000. And that's just like half the day. I don't even know how much they grossed over the, the entire day on, a, on an average day. But I can tell you it would be many hundreds, if not thousands of times more than the workers are being paid. Um, so where does all the excess go? Well, I mean, some of it goes to people that do marketing and people that do actual functions that help bring people into the store and, and that sort of thing. But at some point, the, the leftover profit is just accumulating at the top. And why? It's, it's only because those owners, the, the people that are in charge of all the decisions of, of who gets what, happen to be owners, that they get to take all that for themselves. Um, so think about that, how much of your effort you are actually being compensated for. Think about if you were being compensated 100%, you know, take out expenses for the day, whatever operating costs you have, and after that, you were taking 100% of, of what your labor was generating, you know, distributed between all the different employees that were working on the same shift as you. Why would your employer even have employees at that point? Because they would have no way to make money for themselves just sitting at the top and owning. So capitalism, this is why they say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Capitalism, by necessity, the form is to take a portion of the workers' uh, generated value, value that they generate by doing their job for yourself just because you're an owner. I don't think that's a very fair system. It's certainly not a system that any of us have any say in. It's not a democratic system. It's a very top-down authoritarian system. You not speak of the cartloads of oysters thrown into the sea to prevent a dainty, hitherto reserved for the rich, from becoming a food for the people. We need not speak of the thousand and one luxuries, stuffs, foods, etc., etc., treated after the same fashion as the oysters. It is enough to remember the way in which the production of the most necessary things is limited. Legions of miners are ready and willing to dig out coal every day and send it to those who are shivering with cold, but too often a third or even two-thirds of their number are forbidden to work more than three days a week. Because, forsooth, the price of coal must be kept up. Thousands of weavers are forbidden to work the looms, though their wives and children go in rags, and though three quarters of the population of Europe have no clothing worthy the name. Hundreds of blast furnaces, thousands of factories periodically stand idle, others only work half time, and in every civilized nation there is a permanent population of about two million individuals who ask only for work, but to whom work is denied. How gladly would these millions of men set to work to reclaim wastelands, or to transform ill-cultivated land into fertile fields, rich in harvests? A year of well-directed toil would suffice to multiply fivefold the produce of dry lands in the south of France, which now yield only about eight bushels of wheat per acre. But these men, who would be happy to become hardy pioneers in so many branches of wealth-producing activity, must stay their hands because the owners of the soil, the mines, and the factories prefer to invest their capital— stolen in the first place from the community, in Turkish or Egyptian bonds, or in Patagonian gold mines, and so make Egyptian falas, Italian exiles, and Chinese coolies their wage slave. That sounds a little bit familiar to rich people, and instead of passing along the profits to their, their workers, um, instead of taking extra profits and creating more jobs and stuff like that, this whole idea of, of trickle-down economics, instead of that, just investing it in long-term wealth-building uh, devices 
lot of parallels to today still because we're still in the midst of capitalism. Yes. So much for the direct and deliberate limitation of production, but there is also a limitation indirect and not of set purpose, which consists in spending human toil on objects absolutely useless or destined only to satisfy the dull vanity of the rich. It is impossible to reckon in figures the extent to which wealth is restricted indirectly, the extent to which energy is squandered that might have served to produce, and above all, to prepare the machinery necessary to production. It is enough to cite the immense sums spent by Europe in armaments for the sole purpose of acquiring control of the markets, and so forcing her own commercial standards on neighboring territories and making exploitation easier at home, the millions paid every year to officials of all sorts, whose function is to maintain the rights of minorities, the right, that is, of a few rich men, to manipulate the economic activities of the nation, the millions spent on judges, prisons, policemen, and all the paraphernalia of so-called justice, spent to no purpose because we know that every alleviation, however slight, of the wretchedness of our great cities is followed by a very considerable diminution of crime. Lastly, and right there, there you have it. They knew even back then that adding in more police, more judges, more more apparatus of law to help try and control uh, the working class didn't bring about a proportional reduction in crime. And why could that be? Is that because the poor are just inherently violent? You know, they're just uh, immoral, you know, something wrong that, that has caused them to be poor? Or is it because, in fact, the conditions that cause them to be poor also push them towards crime, especially petty crime, like theft, um, selling drugs, you know, on and on. So you can throw all the police you want at uh, the problem, but if the underlying cause of that problem, that being that some people are, are kept without uh, the basic necessities of their life or very poor quality uh, for the, their necessities of life, you're not going to end up solving that problem just by, it's not a problem of policing. It's a, it's a problem of the, the system providing for a small group of people at the, the direct expense of the people at the bottom. See the millions spent on propagating pernicious doctrines by means of the press and news cooked in the interest of this or that party, of this politician or of that company of exploiters. But over and above this, we must take into account all the labor that goes to sheer waste in keeping up the stables, the kennels, and the retinue of the rich, for instance, in pandering to the caprices of society and to the depraved tastes of the fashionable mob. In forcing the consumer on the one hand to buy what he does not need or foisting an inferior article upon him by means of puffery, and in producing on the other hand wares which are absolutely injurious, but profitable to the manufacturer. What is squandered in this manner would be enough to double our real wealth, or so to plenish our mills and factories with machinery that they would soon flood the shops with all that is now lacking to two-thirds of the nation. Under our present system, a full quarter of the producers in every nation are forced to be idle for three or four months in the year, and the labor for another quarter, if not of the half, has no better results than the amusement of the rich or the exploitation of the public. Thus, if we consider on the one hand the rapidity with which civilized nations augment their powers of production, and on the other hand the limits set to that production, be it directly or indirectly, by existing conditions, one cannot but conclude that an economic system a trifle more enlightened would permit them to heap up in a few years so many useful products that they would be constrained to cry, Enough! We have enough coal and bread and raiment. Let us rest and consider how best to use our powers, how best to employ our leisure. And that is the same, if not more so, today. We produce more housing than we need. We have something like, uh, what is it like? Oh, it I suppose it depends on the city, but overall in America, we have something like somewhere between three and seven houses sitting vacant for every homeless person that there is. We have more food that could feed the entire world, like uh, probably twice over. Uh, it's it's a question one of distribution, but then also of doing these things like you know artificial price raising through dumping of, of food. It's through uh, just the gross waste of of um, restaurants and cafes and every every bit of the every chain in the every link in the chain of the food production system. All this stuff could be doing going to feed everyone completely. 
I give everyone not only the not enough calories to survive, but enough nutrition to thrive. Uh, we could do away with the clothing shortages, like the, the way that we produce clothing now, this, this uh, fast fashion trend uh, where we produce really shoddy clothing that just gets uh, torn apart uh, and used up because the, the trends have changed within the time that uh, you have it. And you, you pay a couple bucks for it, you get a new shirt in uh, the next few months or whatever. If instead we built uh, things to last, we could have more than enough clothing to, to clothe everyone finally, uh, to have stuff that people would feel good about wearing, you know, on and on, all the different needs that people have, we have in abundance, overabundance already. We produce overabundance. Think about if we spent part of the year just producing enough uh, for everyone's needs and then for the rest of the year decided what to do with it, whether to put away extra stores for uh, times when, for future times when things might get tough, whether we're just going to take a rest, take a break, as they were talking about. Think of how different a world that would be if everything was, was going to produce everyone's needs rather than just uh, the needs of a few and, and the scraps for the many, the, just the bare minimum, if that, for the many. Uh, we have more educational opportunities than anyone could ever use. And the list goes on and on. We have abundance now. And there's nothing that says that if we switch to a different form than capitalism, if we took up socialism where people would have a democratic say in their workplace, there's nothing to say that we would have any less production, any less capacity for production. Um, in fact, we probably have more because the more people that have a say in a business, the more chances there are for good opportunities to come to the top. Um, I think I've said it before on stream, but imagine how many geniuses, how many people that could revolutionize the world have lived and died toiling in a field or a factory simply because they didn't have the right opportunities afforded to them to get their genius out there. They didn't meet the right people, didn't, weren't born into the right family, didn't win the genetic lottery, you know. Think of how much more we could bring to the fore if we started to value everyone and look at everyone as potentially a huge contributor to the, the wealth of knowledge and material that humanity has built up generation after generation. No, plenty for all is not a dream, though it was a dream indeed in those old days when man, for all his pains, could hardly win a bushel of wheat from an acre of land, and had to fashion by hand all the implements he used in agriculture and industry. Now it is no longer a dream, because man has invented a motor which, with a little iron and a few pounds of coal, gives him the mastery of a creature strong and docile as a horse and capable of setting the most complicated machinery in motion. But if plenty for all is to become a reality, this immense capital, cities, houses, pastures, arable lands, factories, highways, education, must cease to be regarded as private property for the monopolist to dispose of at his pleasure. This rich endowment, painfully won, builded, fashioned, or invented by our ancestors, must become common property so that the collective interests of men may gain from it the greatest good for all. And again, this is going back to that concept from the last chapter, the idea of all for all, that all of the, the, the knowledge that we have, all of the material goods and material well-being that we have, um, all of our ingenuity is not just something that's been invented whole cloth by the people that are in charge right now. It's not as though Elon Musk invented a single thing that he talks about. No, he built off the, the wealth of knowledge that spans back to physicists, to engineers, to metallurgists, on and on and on to get to the point where he can put rockets that go, he can build rockets that go into space. Um, he can dream about having things like the Hyperloop and you know all these other things. So... The idea being that since this, this wealth has come from all people from the past, why then are only a few given the privilege of benefiting from that because they're owners? Uh, why, is, why is it not all for all? Because it comes from all, why not go back to all for the well-being of everybody? And we certainly could do that. There's, there's, like I said, there's more than enough for everybody in any capacity that you can think of right now. And we can continue that into the future and just distribute things differently, at least to the point where everyone has the basic necessities of their life. Um, 
So, yeah. There must be expropriation. The well-being of all, the end. Expropriation, the means. Part 2. Expropriation, such then, is the problem which history has put before the men of the 20th century. The return to communism in all that ministers to the well-being of man. But this problem cannot be solved by means of legislation. No one imagines that. The poor, no less than the rich, understand that neither the existing governments nor any which might arise out of the possible political changes would be capable of finding a solution. We feel the necessity of a social revolution. Rich and poor alike recognize that this revolution is imminent, that it may break out in a very few years. A great change in thought has been accomplished during the last half of the 19th century, but suppressed as it was by the property classes and denied its natural development. This new spirit must break now its bonds by violence and realize itself in a revolution. Whence comes the revolution and how will it announce its coming? None can answer these questions. The future is hidden. But those who watch and think do not misinterpret the signs. Workers and exploiters, revolutionists and conservatives, thinkers and men of action all feel that the revolution is at our doors. Well, what are we to do when the thunderbolt has fallen? It's kind of interesting that uh, he's talking about how there's a revolution in the air. Like it, it, Things kind of seem inevitable. that They've, they've built up to a point where something's got to give. That uh, you know, People are talking about how conditions have to change. Um, and think about the parallels to today. How, uh, especially for millennials, people of my generation, um, and then coming up the Zoomers, I'm sure they're going to go through the same sort of thing. Uh, but just starting in, say, the 08 crash, uh, the housing bubble, where that woke up a lot of people to the, the idea that they weren't quite as secure as they thought they were, that things weren't quite as fair as, as they thought they had been, which led to... Uh, um, the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations where, where, you know, that, you know, I hear from a lot of the different uh, leftist creators across the different platforms how that was one of their defining moments that radicalized them a lot and made them start to open up to these, these ideas of uh, something different than capitalism, uh, something different than a system that works for the few, you know, the, the 99%. Uh, get sacrificed in, for the, the needs of the one percent, um, and millennials have had it tough. Like the material conditions have been such that it, it should be good for at least a revolution in thought. Uh, I, th I believe we're the first generation since I believe uh, World War II that is going to have that has less material comfort than uh, the generations before us. Um, and so then things like Occupy led to uh, the rise of both Trump as, as a reactionary to Obama and uh, reaction against Occupy, but also people like uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, people that, that come and, and unabashedly call themselves a socialist, even though in, you know, if you look at his, his actual work and his actual uh, legislation that he's, he's put up and the things, his rhetoric and the thing, the bills that he sponsors, um, he's still talking about keeping in capitalism. He's just talking about, he's more of a social democrat, uh, which we've talked about before, where you have robust social programs plus a few uh, systems that could be seen as, as socialists, such as socialized or social uh, medicine, so providing some of the, the basic needs for people. Um, through the government, through taxes. Um, so yeah, so there's a rise of Bernie and, and the idea that it's no longer nearly as stigmatized to uh, call yourself a leftist or a socialist or communist or an anarchist even. These ideas have have lost their um, reactionary, you know, knee-jerk, or knee-jerk reactions, I should say. Um, and so then through... Trump pushing things even further backwards, making things a lot harder for a lot of people, especially uh, various minority groups. Um, that has led to the, the rise of this, this recent online left, which I'm very grateful to you know, be a very small part of, but hopefully growing. Um, 
but there's just been an explosion, especially since 2018, and there's just a huge explosion of, of creators, especially through YouTube and Twitch, people talking about politics, people bringing out ideas that are new to, say, the millennial and the Zoomer generation, but, you know, have been around for quite some time, just uh, basically from Ronald Reagan and uh, the rise of neoliberalism to Occupy, you could say. These ideas have been suppressed and kind of uh, pushed into the underground and into the back burners of conversation. But but now these ideas are coming back out. They're gaining steam. Um, there's hundreds of creators in, in every platform you can think of now. And I think it's only going to grow. Because, again, those conditions that are, are, are underlying and causing it are not getting better. We're, we're having such a struggle just to raise the minimum wage. It hasn't been raised since, like, 20 years. Um, from seven twenty-five an hour, which... You know, I make about three times that at my, at my current job. And I'm still, I'm just barely getting by, you know. Um, I can only imagine, I, I mean, I can't really even imagine how a family can even get through having, even having two parents who are working minimum wage. You can't really. You have to have multiple jobs at that point. And at that point, you're throwing away so much of your life to, or you're sacrificing so much of your life to work. Or what kind of a life are you actually even having? What are you actually building for your kids if you can't even spend the time you would be off from a normal job, you know, interacting with them and helping them grow and that sort of thing. So, and we've been fighting for the minimum wage raised to, uh, we've been fighting for the, the raise of the minimum wage to 15 for so long that it no longer is even a livable wage at this point. It should really be around $20 or more just to, to have people to give people a bare amount to, to get by and we're not talking about luxurious lifestyles if you're making you know forty thousand dollars a year you're not living in the lap of luxury by any means in the united states i don't care where you're from um that's that's not really too much to ask for but we're having to fight so hard for that that you can see that the powers that be uh that that neoliberalism still holds sway over the levers of power in a very big way so but because again because the, the underlying conditions aren't changing i can only see that this movement is going to keep growing uh, i had a question there uh perennial perennial green says how about capitalism ruins medicine too absolutely it does when we have insulin and inhalers and, and people can't afford drugs that have been in production for decades because we can't hurt the manufacturer or to add on to that uh we can't even put price controls on, on basic drugs that are life-saving. Imagine, I mean, I'm sure many of you don't have to imagine having to pay to keep living like that. Like people that need inhalers and insulin and, you know, um, say EpiPen, stuff like that. What are you going to do if you don't, if you can't afford to have that sort of thing? We're just going to let people die? Is, is that it? Is that in the name of, of protecting the the rights of the, the capitalist to make whatever profit they feel the market can bear? Um, it just seems grotesque to me to put people's lives in, in the hands of people that are just looking to make an extra buck. Um, so if we had socialized medicine, if we had the government as the single payer, uh, that's a very big bargaining chip that we can use as as people that elect elected officials that we could use against drug makers to force them to put their drug prices down. People talk a lot about uh, Canadian health care and how they still have to pay for their prescriptions. And they're working on, on getting that covered, too, as well as dental and vision, I believe. Um but yes, they do still have to pay for their prescriptions, even though they have some form of, of universal health care. Uh, but they pay a lot less. They pay a whole lot less than we do here. We, we get gouged the most in the U.S. because of our, our private, I mean, we're, the only, we're the only country in the world that, that has our level of industrialization that, that still doesn't have uh, some form of socialized medicine, some form of universal health care. It's, it's ridiculous, you know. I mean, if Mexico can do it, if, if other much poorer countries than us can do it, 
then how can you ever say that the richest country in history can't afford to do it? It's just insane. It's 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 logic that only benefits people that uh, have so much money that they can get like world class, like above and beyond healthcare. Like that's really all that goes to serve. So don't believe that sort of thing. It's just it's uh, nonsense when you when you actually look at it. Richest country in the world, we can afford to to keep our people healthy. No question about it. One. We have all been studying the dramatic side of revolution so much and the practical work of revolution so little that we are apt to see only the stage effects, so to speak, of these great movements. The fight of the first days, the barricades. But this fight, this first skirmish, is soon ended, and it is only after the overthrow of the old constitution that the real work of revolution can be said to begin. Effete and powerless, attacked on all sides, the old rulers are soon swept away by the breath of insurrection. In a few days, the middle-class monarchy of 1848 was no more, and while Louis-Philippe was making good his escape in a cab, Paris had already forgotten her citizen king. The government of Thiers disappeared on the 18th of March, 1871, in a few hours, leaving Paris mistress of her destinies. Yet 1848 and 1871 were only insurrections. Before a popular revolution, the masters of the old order disappear with a surprising rapidity. Its upholders fly the country to plot in safety elsewhere and to devise measures for their return. The former government having disappeared, the army, hesitating before the tide of popular opinion, no longer obeys its commanders, who have also prudently decamped. The troops stand by without interfering or join the rebels. The police, standing at ease, are uncertain whether to belabor the crowd or to cry, long live the commune, while some retire to their quarters to await the pleasure of the new government. Wealthy citizens pack their trunks and betake themselves to places of safety. The people remain. This is how a revolution is ushered in. In several large towns, the commune is proclaimed. In the streets wander thousands of men who in the evening crowd into improvised clubs asking, what shall we do? And ardently discuss public affairs in which all take an interest. Just a quick side note, uh, Kropotkin actually knew something about the way that uh, post-revolution uh, looks like is he's talking about the Paris Commune when uh, they overthrew the monarch in France, where I believe he was at the time. So, uh, so that's how he knows how to describe all that, that's happening, the way things go down. Those who yesterday were most indifferent are perhaps the most zealous. Everywhere there is plenty of goodwill and a keen desire to make victory certain. It is a time of supreme devotion. The people are ready to go forward. All this is splendid, sublime, but still it is not a revolution. Nay, it is only now that the work of the revolutionist begins. Doubtless the thirst for vengeance will be satisfied. The Watrans and the Thomases will pay the penalty of their unpopularity, but that is only an incident of the struggle and not a revolution. Socialist politicians, radicals, neglected geniuses of journalism, stump orators, middle-class citizens, and workmen hurry to the town hall to the government offices and take possession of the vacant seats. Some rejoice their hearts with galoon, admire themselves in ministerial mirrors, and study to give orders with an air of importance appropriate to their new position. They must have a red sash, an embroidered cap, and magisterial gestures to impress their comrades of the office or the workshop. Others bury themselves in official papers, trying with the best of wills to make head or tail of them. They indict laws and issue high-flown worded decrees that nobody takes the trouble to carry out because the revolution has come. To give themselves an authority which is lacking, they seek the sanction of old forms of government. They take the names of provisional government, committee of public safety, mayor, governor of the town hall, commissioner of public wheel, and whatnot. Elected or acclaimed, they assemble in boards or in communal councils. These bodies include men of 10 or 20 different schools, which, if not exactly private chapels, are at least so many sects which represent as many ways of regarding the scope, the bearing, and the goal of the revolution. Possibilists, collectivists, radicals, Jacobins, Blanquists are thrust together and waste time in wordy warfare. Honest men come into contact with ambitious ones, whose only dream is power and who spurn the crowd once they sprung. Coming together with diametrically opposed views, they are forced to form arbitrary alliances in order to create majorities that can but last a day. 
wrangling, calling each other reactionaries, authoritarians, and rascals, incapable of coming to an understanding on any serious measure, dragged into discussions about trifles, producing nothing better than bombastic proclamations, yet taking themselves seriously, unwitting that the real strength of the movement is in the streets. All this may please those who like the theater, but it is not revolution. Nothing yet has been accomplished. Meanwhile, the people suffer. The factories are idle, the workshops closed. Industry is at a standstill. The worker does not even earn the meager wage which was his before. Food goes up in price. With that heroic devotion which has always characterized them, and which in great crises reaches the sublime, the people wait patiently. We place these three months of one at the service of the Republic, they said in 1848, while their representatives and the gentlemen of the new government, down to the meanest jack in office, received their salary regularly. The people suffer. With the childlike faith, with the good humor of the masses who believe in their leaders, they think that yonder, in the House, in the Town Hall, in the Committee of Public Safety, their welfare is being considered. But yonder, they are discussing everything under the sun except the welfare of the people. In 1793, while famine ravaged France and crippled the revolution, whilst the people were reduced to the depths of misery, whilst the champs élysées were lined with luxurious carriages where women displayed their jewels and splendor, Robespierre was urging the Jacobins to discuss his treatise on the English Constitution. While the worker was suffering in 1848 from the general stoppage of trade, the provisional government and the House were wrangling over military pensions and prison labor without troubling how the people were to live during this crisis. And could one cast a reproach at the Paris Commune, which was born beneath the Prussian cannon, and lasted only 70 days, it would be for this same error, this failure to understand that the revolution could not triumph unless those who fought on its side were fed, that on 15 pence a day a man cannot fight on the ramparts and at the same time support a family. The people suffer and say, how to find the way out of these difficulties? All right, so we just heard a little bit about uh, how this particular revolution went, and, and Kropotkin makes the distinction that uh, just overthrowing the current power structure is not the revolution itself. The revolution itself is making the changes that you're looking for, that is providing for the needs of all uh, and making those needs permanently cared for, and that this particular revolution only lasted uh, 70 days, this, this Paris Commune, because uh, instead of keeping their eyes on that, they, they men would fight for power and new positions, um, and they left a power vacuum. And, and this, this tends to be one of my critiques of, of the idea of having some sort of a quick revolution where, you know, quickly the, the powers that be are brushed aside and a new order is, is filled and, and, you know, things are all great from there on out. Like, it, 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 there's such a... a a uh, precarious moment or a series of moments and all of that where like they said the Prussian cannons coming in and and suppressing the revolution there's there's always a chance that some power is going to come and and take over and, and sweep aside your ideas for revolution or that the wrong people will vie for new powerful positions and new powers will be entrenched that sort of thing uh so if not that I mean is there an alternative is there a different sort of revolution well, actually, tonight I'd like to, to bring out my first big idea of, of the channel um, and tell you that I believe there is an alternative to the fast revolution, and that would be what I'm terming uh, stone soup socialism, or a small and slow revolution. Um, and keen-eared listeners from previous streams will, will note that uh, small and slow revolution is a play on small and slow solutions from the permaculture principles. I think permaculture has a big part to play in all of this. Absolutely so. So, if we, instead of working out, you know, how the new power structure is going to be, we, we worry about sweeping aside all these powers and, and doing away with them permanently and putting down counter-revolutions, on and on and on and on, instead of focusing on that, if we start small and focusing on how to meet the people's needs while at the same time collectively building power together, um, I think maybe we have a, a better chance of, of producing something permanent, something replicable, something that could spread from a small group of people outward, and something that focuses on the right thing, which is the results, it's the consequences of revolution.
rather than the 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 titles and the circum you know the, all the the pomp and circumstance of it and, and you know arguing about who's doing what and, and, and so forth so if we use the principles starting with the principles of permaculture focusing on earth care people care and redistributing the surplus to the the service of the first two we can come up with uh, a very small um, but potentially long-term impactful uh, revolution so to speak and, and the way I propose it is to start with a stock pot it's, you know just a large kitchen pot and a bunch of soup and uh, or stew or, or fresh ingredients whatever you have in surplus um, or can get with, without putting yourself in a precarious position. Um, even if it's something you could get from, you know, what the local food producers throw out or would throw out. Um, whether that's, you know, through just going and talking to them and see if you can pick up stuff at the end of a shift or whether it's uh, dumpstering it yourself, you know, doing the, the gorilla um, route. But whatever it is, however you can get it. If you start with a stock pot and a means to cook it, um, I'd say that would be step one in this sort of uh, small and slow revolution. And from there, uh, you should select a public space where there's a lot of people. And this is where new urbanism comes into play a lot, because what I'm proposing is going to be a lot harder to do if you're in a very low density area uh, without a lot of public space. You say you're in the suburbs, you only have a handful of parks in the entire city. Um, you don't have a lot of traffic through those parks. Uh, you may have even tighter regulations in those parks. Um, and that's another part that new urbanism or more specifically urban planning comes into play. Look up your local regulations about how, when, and what the circumstances are for cooking food in a park. Um, if you're just having, I mean, the, there's virtually no parks uh, where people gather, especially in urban areas where you can't at least have a barbecue or there may be barbecue pits for people to use. Whatever, look around, see what's available to you, and, and see what's the the best approach for not getting shut down, basically. Um, you don't have to put up signs for what you're doing. You don't have to make a big to-do about it. Just go there, set up a pot, and a table, some paper bowls, some, some spoons, um, that sort of thing, and just start redistributing some of your uh, surplus, uh, in this case, in, in the form of food. And if you do this, you, you go and feed. It doesn't have to be, you know, some formal organized thing. It could just be you and, and someone to help you. It could, be, it could be as easy as starting with two people, one person to cook, one person to serve, you know, sort of avoiding cross-contamination as much as possible. Um, and I know this is difficult still. We're still in the time of covid uh, people are, are wary about you know, food contamination and that sort of thing. But, you know, there's still restaurants that are, are doing curbside and they manage to do that without sickening people all the time. So if you're wearing your protective gear, your, your gloves, your um, face masks at all times, and you're making sure to heat the, the food to uh, a, a safe level i think it's 140 degrees don't quote me on that look these regulations look these these food safe food handling regulations and uh uh measures up for yourself but if you heat the food up um you're, you're making sure to clean everything before and after and you're in the open air um it's probably going to even be a safer way to to distribute food than in a closed kitchen taking it out to various people so, so don't let that get you down. Um, and you know, uh, in, my, in my city, I know that there's been a lot of homeless camps that have propped up even over the winter. You, you see them again and again. And uh, I'm assuming it's the, the mayor is ordering the park workers to come in and just bulldoze them. I know there's one in Minneapolis recently, fairly large one that, that just got... You know, they, they tacked up little eviction notices to each of the tents and then they just bulldozed everything. And I don't know what happened to all those people. I don't know if they were, were helped into shelters. Uh, my thought is, no, they're just kind of being pushed along, 
you know, swept under the rug, so to speak. Um, that could be a place that you could start, start in a homeless camp. Uh, you know those people really need it. And this could be a way to, to start helping build community connections while getting them back on their feet. Okay, so you have your, your stock pot going. And after doing this week after week, month after month, just, just pick a day of the week, whatever day works best for you. Pick a, a, a general time that you know you can be there. Um, and then just week after week, if you keep coming and you keep coming, you're just naturally going to start build to, to build community connections. People will tell each other, you know, oh, hey, you know, they, they, this guy comes and serves food or, or these couple of people, they come by and they, they serve us food uh, every Friday or whatever, at, say, 6 o'clock in this particular park or, or part of the city. Um, so turn up. I don't think it. I don't think it went into the means of heating it. Um, just as, as a technical note, I think my preference would be something like a a propane burner. Um, if you look for a pro, propane stove, I think is what's, what's usually referred to. Just that so you don't have to worry about any sort of wood ash or charcoal ash or having to deal with any of that. It's very clean. You know, you know it's a, a clean burning propane. Uh, that was terrible. Should be ashamed of myself, but anyway, uh, I, I think propane is probably going to be your best bet to have a reliable and, and clean source of, of fuel that you don't have to worry about disposing of, and that's going to build confidence in you know if there's local park patrols that don't like what you're doing, at least they'll know that you're not a danger to uh, leaning, leaving any sort of smoldering ashes or anything like that. So just something to consider. Well, that's one little side, um, but. I would say that uh, this should be something that you look at as, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say pure, but just something that you shouldn't have an agenda for necessarily. If you, if you build community connections and something comes of that, uh, you start meeting people that, that know people that, you know, you can maybe all get together and, and take it to the next step and, and form, say, worker cooperative or something like that it doesn't have to be based on on food but whatever it is your mutual interest is that's great but i would say try and keep this simple don't put too much uh into it just make it be what it is just a, a way to share the surplus to give people basic necessities to to do mutual aid because you think it's the right thing to do to, to start this, this is how community is built you know it's not through executive order or, or um, a mayor's decree or a new piece of legislation passing. These are the ways that community bonds really form. Um, if you live in an apartment, think of how many people you actually know in the apartment complex. I mean, I know a few. I, I know by name the people that live on my floor except for one guy um, and then a couple more people in my immediate building, but I don't know anyone in the other complex. You know, look at this as an opportunity. Maybe you could do this right in your apartment complex, like on the lawn somewhere, as long as you don't involve the management company um, or get the permission if they're that kind of management company or if you actually have that space designated. Um, but just look at this as an opportunity to start building community. And then, you know, people are going to talk. People are going to start uh, getting to know each other, getting to trust each other. That's a big part of it. And eventually, things like politics are, are just naturally going to come up. Uh, and you might get to the point where you have enough people with just enough means that you could build some sort of cooperative. And in my case, uh, I think my ideal co uh, cooperative to start with uh, would be something like a cafe. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because of the principle of stacking functions. And that is something that's a permaculture concept. Um, where you have a bunch of elements that all serve one function and a bunch of functions served by each element. Um, and I think something like a cafe has a really good potential for stacking functions. Um, so I'm just going to pause the game for one second to show you. Not that. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I wrote an article for a local urban planning blog called The Frosty Fish, a vision, a vision for the Future of Urban Farming. And in that, I lay out 
my vision for uh, all that one cafe could be. And it, it includes things like not just the, the food and the drink that's sold, but also it would have an aquaponics greenhouse uh, attached to it. For those unfamiliar, aquaponics is the merger of hydroponics, which is growing things in a liquid medium, and aquaculture, which is raising fish. And the, base, the very basic principle is you have a tank for the fish, the fish produce waste, that waste is then circulated through uh, what's called pebble beds that, that food's growing in. So there's never any contact between the water and the, and the food itself. It's very safe. You don't have to worry about any sort of uh, contamination of the actual edible parts of it. It's just going through the roots of the, the grow beds um, and that provides uh, fertilizer in essence for the plants which grow better. And then those plants serve to filter the water for the fish. So you have this, you have the mimic, the, the very rudiments of uh, a functioning ecosystem happening here, where one system feeds into the other and it goes in a big cycle. So you can have that attached to a cafe. Grow a portion of your food hyper locally, you know, in your mixed green salads or um, various herbs or spices, or things like that. Uh, and then also have a source of, of fish protein too, which uh, has always been very important for humanity. Fish has always been a staple food of pretty much every people's, um, except for ones I would assume that are in very deserted areas. But uh, so you can have that. That's another function that your cafe could could house. You could also have um, radical literature. You could have a little library that has stuff like the conquest of bread there, so that people could start conversations about the the sort of a future you want to see, and you know then you could have a meeting space where various organizations could form and, and have a place to, to start building new projects of their own. You, you act as like a beachhead, basically, for uh, more activism, for more cooperatives eventually to sprout from. If you become profitable enough, you can use that money to, to uh, help fund more um, cooperatives and, and, and so on and so on. Um, they would go on and form cooperatives and, and help help fund cooperatives of another person, you know, and, and just keep on going, building this coalition of cooperatives um, to the point where you have a real uh, breeding ground for these ideas, uh, a real way to disseminate this information um, and this theory, but also the practice of, of having a more democratic system. And when I say cooperative, I'm talking about worker-owned cooperatives where you're still going to have, you know, a manager and a cash or cashier, if it's like a cafe we're talking about again, um, but that cashier has a say in the working conditions, the hours, how they're distributed. Um, they're going to have a say in the democratic say, that means one vote, one person uh, for how much they're compensated, both in benefits and wages. Uh, they're going to have a say in if and how pensions are funded, on and on and on. Uh, it's, it's, it's more democracy and more freedom than the average worker has in their workplace right now. Think of the place that you work right now. How much of a say do you actually have? You don't. You, you, your boss has all the say, basically. It's an authoritarian, top-down system. Instead, what a worker cooperative is, is a more horizontally formed system of power uh, with more democracy and more freedom. So that's what we're talking about. So you build up this beachhead of, of cooperatives. Like you like you, you say you start in a, in a large city, whatever the largest city near you is. And, and eventually you get to the point where there's a huge network of cooperatives. Well, then you can start branching out into the suburbs. And then once those get bit big and strong enough, you can branch out to the countryside. And that's where permaculture really comes in because you can start funding uh, farming operations that produce not only food, but fuel, fiber, fodder, which is animal feed, uh, and pharmacy, um, as, as, as well as, as the food for people. And you can start taking away a lot of the power that, that these larger companies have over you. So think about it. If you had all your needs met, 
would you worry so much about, uh, you know, whether or not there's a Walmart in your town? Would you worry about if, if the jobs of some large um, producer or some, some large business uh, got outsourced in one way or another? Would you worry about automation? Would they be able to pull these levers over you and, and your city to get these tax breaks? Because, uh, you know, make no mistake, these large corporations like Target um, in, in the Twin Cities here, they get huge tax breaks just for locating their op their operations, you know, within the city limits of, say, Minneapolis. Um, and they, they negotiate that by saying, we're going to bring in all these jobs. Look at all these jobs we can bring in. And then the consequence of that, though, is they're not putting back into the tax system. So all that money is lost. All that money that could go to, to public programs is lost. So they have a huge lever that they can manipulate politics. Well, if instead we had a lot of our needs met through our own networks, um, they would have a much less of a say. Their, their threats would mean much less. Uh, so this, this, this idea of building a network of cooperatives is taking more and more of the power away from those that control your lives right now and putting it in the hands of those who are looking to have a more egalitarian system, a more anarcho-communist system. Um, and then once you get to a certain point, like if, the, if this were to say, start out in one city and then go to another city, and then a bunch of major cities adopted a program like this, uh, just going back to the, that, that first idea of starting with the, the stone soup, um, if, if, if a thousand people did, and then a hundred thousand people, and a million people did it in all these different cities, and over time got to the point where we were building up these cooperatives, um, eventually we'd come to the point where there'd be a tipping point, and these ideas of more democracy in everyday life, more fairness and freedom in everyday life, would take over as being the, the social norm. And at that point, when everyone's basically used to the ideas of socialism, it wouldn't really be that big of a leap to just push through that, that leftward wall of, of capitalism and make for an actual uh, revolution. And it wouldn't even have to necessarily be an overthrow. It could just be a, a matter of course, really. Like people saying, yeah, you know, we've been living this way for generations now. Uh, it just makes sense. Let's 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 do away with the old systems of exploitation and rebuild something new. So that's my idea for a small and slow revolution. And just one more note I want to say on that: uh, the biggest challenge, for sure, I I would say I would see as going from just doing the stone soup to making it a, a viable cooperative. That's a lot of work. Uh, that's a lot of money and a lot of that, that's when you're the most vulnerable and the most risky. Um, so don't be dismayed if you actually end up trying something like this and nothing more comes from it than just a bunch of neighbors getting together and talking about things. You're still successful then. And that's still something where like, you know, as people naturally talk, something good could still come of it. Say uh, a bunch of renters have the same property management company with the same landlord and they just through this get together and make that physical connection and say oh yeah you know he's, he doesn't do any snow removal and like uh, my apartment got broken into and they they blame me and you know they charge me huge uh cleanup fees or something like that. whatever it is you can talk about the issues you're having about pest control and that's something that that i'm sure a lot of, of urban dwellers are familiar with is, is the just the difficulty in getting any sort of property management company or landlord to do anything about the pests and having them, you know, start by trying to blame their tenants when, you know, you keep a, you keep a clean home and, and there's, there's, or you live way up on the, the third or fourth floor or whatever it is, there's no way that you could be attracting in any sort of pests. But, but there it is, them trying to squeeze every dollar out of you. But if you got together and talked with other people, you could organize a renter strike or you could uh, organize a, a, a tenant's uh, union. There's, there's any number of, of, of 
organizations that could come out of this. It doesn't just have to be cooperatives. So, so, so circling it back again, if, if you try something like this and only a couple of people show up the first time and maybe a handful of people stay from, you know, month to month or week to week, you're still successful. You're still doing the good work of building community. So that alone, I think, makes it worth trying something like this. Just trying that basic, trying to do that basic building block of community. And that, 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 that covers all the different theories that I talk about. That's, that's the, the mutual aid of anarcho-communism. That is the, the facilitating of community and building of community bonds of new urbanism. That is the, the sharing of surplus, the, the people care and the earth care of, of permaculture. It all comes together in something really simple, but something that can be very, very powerful. And that's, that's uh, stone soup socialism a small and slow revolution. So food for thought. Just give, mull that over in the next week. Think about it. Think if that's something that might appeal to you. Come and check out my uh, article here. Uh, you're going to have to look it up. It's on streets.mn. And it, if you just search for The Frosty Fish, A Vision of the Future of Urban Garden, of Urban Farming, excuse me, uh, it'll come right up, and you'll see this this beautiful picture, which I did not make. I found this this graphic online, but that's a, an idea of what an aquaponic system could look like. Um, and I go into a bunch of details about how I came about with my idea, some of the different technologies that would be that could be employed, both natural and uh, mechanical, and uh, a lot of the different functions that could be stacked all together. So I invite you to give that a, a try. Uh, the Frosty Fish, A Vision for the Future of Urban Farming on streets.mn. All right, we're going to get back into it and wrap up with this recording. Uh, we only have about three more minutes, so not too much left to discuss on this. So, yeah, sorry, that was a, a, a longer aside, but I just want to make sure to, to give that idea the, the time that I felt it was due. And we'll, we'll, that was just a basic sketch of, of my idea. We'll talk more in depth about it in later in later discussions, and later streams. Part three. It seems to us that there is only one answer to this question. We must recognize and loudly proclaim that everyone, whatever his grade in the old society, whether strong or weak, capable or incapable, has before everything the right to live. And that society is bound to share amongst all, without exception, the means of existence at its disposal. We must acknowledge this and proclaim it aloud and act up to it. It must be so contrived that from the first day of the revolution, the worker shall know that a new era is opening before him. That henceforward, none need crouch under the bridges with palaces hard by, none need fast in the midst of food, none need perish with cold near shops full of furs. That all is for all, in practice as well as in theory, and that at last, for the first time in history, a revolution has been accomplished, which considers the needs of the people before schooling them in their duties." This cannot be brought about by acts of parliament, but only by taking immediate and effective possession of all that is necessary to ensure the well-being of all. This is the only really scientific way of going to work, the only way to be understood and desired by the mass of the people. We must take possession in the name of the people of the granaries, the shops full of clothing, and the dwelling houses. Nothing must be wasted. We must organize without delay to feed the hungry, to satisfy all wants, to meet all needs, to produce, not for the special benefit of this one or that one, but to ensure that society as a whole will live and grow. Enough of ambiguous words like the right to work, with which the people were misled in 1840. Oh boy, right to work. Like this is the, you're going to hear this is exactly the same sort of thing they talk about with right to work laws right now. It's, it's a sick uh, joke that they play on workers to try and trick them out of their their own power 48 and which are still used to mislead them let us have the courage to recognize that well-being for all henceforward possible must be realized when the workers claimed the right to work in 1848 national and municipal workshops were organized and workmen were sent to drudge there at a rate of one shilling eight pence a day when they asked that labor should be organized the reply was patience friends the government will see to it meantime here is your one shilling eight pence Rest now, brave toiler, after your lifelong struggle for food. Meantime, the cannons were trained, the reserves called out, and the workers themselves disorganized by the many methods well known to the middle classes. Till one fine day, they were told to go and colonize Africa or be shot down. 
Very different will be the result if the workers claim the right to well-being. In claiming that right, they claim the right to possess the wealth of the community, to take the houses to dwell in according to the needs of each family, to seize the stores of food and learn the meaning of plenty, after having known famine too well. They proclaim their right to all wealth, fruit of the labor of past and present generations, and learn by its means to enjoy those higher pleasures of art and science too long monopolized by the middle classes. And while asserting their right to live in comfort, they assert, what is still more important, their right to decide for themselves what this comfort shall be, what must be produced to ensure it, and what discarded as no longer of value. The right to well-being means the possibility of living like human beings. All right, that's a very important concept that they're talking about, the, the right to, to live like a human being. So this is talking about uh, a system that is set up to provide for the needs of all, and that includes things like food and clothing and heat transportation, uh, in communication, both uh, in this day and age, online, and, and uh, to get uh, not only friendships, but also to procure work, but also uh, when it comes to concepts of like new urbanism, organizing the city in a way that facilitates people to uh, interact with one another. And, and that also applies to community, which is another need of people, uh, as well as shelter, health care, uh, and education. Um, so th those are some of the basics that uh, this sort of a society should be organizing around to provide for everybody. That the, Again, the idea of all for all. Um, and there's a part to play for all the different theories that we talk about, you know, a permaculture producing uh, food in a, in, a, in a more sustainable and integrated way. Uh, not only in the countryside, but also in the city as much as possible, uh, producing clothing in a better way, uh, heat um, through the, the different products of the land, um, new urbanism, uh, providing for things like well-organized transportation and, and communication and providing space for education um, and healthcare in a way that everyone has access to it, as well as providing for housing. Shelter is a, a big part of, of new urbanism, um, as well as just facilitating that community, that, that root building block of new urbanism, just uh, facilitating better community bonds and that sort of thing. And of bringing up children to be members of a society better than ours, whilst the right to work only means the right to be always a wage slave, a drudge, ruled over and exploited by the middle class of the future. The right to well-being is the social revolution. The right to work means nothing but the treadmill of commercialism. It is high time for the worker to assert his right to the common inheritance and to enter into possession. Mm -hmm. End of chapter two. All right, and that wraps up chapter two of The Conquest of Bread. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. Uh, we're going to have another chapter next week. And... Uh, continue these same sorts of themes. We're going to flesh out these ideas even more. Um, I hope I hope you're enjoying this book as much as, as I am. This is one of my favorite books. This is one of the things that, that convinced me to be, uh, to follow the, the anarcho-communist path. Um, because I just, I like the, the orientation, the way it, it's so humanitarian, so much humanity put into it. Providing all for all, that, that just makes a lot of sense to me. Taking the wealth of, of everybody and, and providing more wealth for, for, for everybody. And not, not wealth in the terms in terms of excess, but uh, just in terms of material comfort and, and getting people to a point where they can be their best version of themselves. That sort of thing. So this was a good chapter. I, I enjoyed this chapter a lot. I, I'd love to know what you thought about it. Uh, and uh, any any anything you would add to it, any flaws you saw in the logic, you know, what, what, were you, what are you thinking about that sort of thing? Ah, the audio is leaps and bounds improved. Thanks for the adjustment. Yeah, I'm I'm really trying to to work with this microphone to to be a lot better, um, and, and adjust the levels in a way that you know things are clear. So I I'm, I'm glad to. Now that I've accomplished that. So, but before I go, I'm going to do my uh, 
my segments on my boost of the week. I'm going to show you a couple of different leftist creators that I think deserve some more love, some more following, and some more um, some more of your time, really. So the first one, I'm going to switch my screen here. Uh, we're going to go to Mark's Madness. Uh, this is a podcast. It's it's not only is it very informative, they're gonna they do a lot of what I do, they except for they they take Marxist literature. I think they only do Marxist literature. I'm I haven't listened to enough episodes to know if they do anyone else. But they start with like the Communist Manifesto and and principles of, of communism and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, they summarize it, but they're really hilarious too. Like one of the guys I believe is actually a comedian. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a fun way to explore theory. Um, it, it, they don't go through the actual audiobooks like I do, but you get a good, you get a very good summary, uh, on both an academic level, but, it, but it's presented in a way that's very digestible. And, and like, it, I just keep saying it, but it, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's hilarious the way that they portray Marx and, um, and the theories. It just, it's a, a reverent but informative way of, of looking at, at Marxist literature. So that is uh, Marx Madness. You can find it on whatever podcast platform you have. Uh, they are explicit. You know, they, they, they use some curse words, but that's about it. They're not getting into uh, talk of, you know, sex or anything that uh, young ears wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be good to hear for them. So you don't have to worry about that part. But uh, I can't recommend it enough. Mark's Madness. So then my second boost of the week is the YouTube channel, uh, Zoe Baker, also called Anarcho Pack. And uh, Zoe is a uh, anarchist and a scholar. And she she does a lot of the same things that uh, Mark's Madness does, but on the anarchist side. So if you look at her playlist, she, you have... Uh, she also has a podcast too by the same name. I think it's Anarcho Pack in the in, in the podcast form. Uh, but she goes through queer history. She is herself a trans woman. Uh, but there's like everything from anarchism 101 to history of cynicalism, syndicalism, uh, to general stuff about the left. Uh, she does a whole variety of different sort of, of content and. Man, I gotta say, one of the most well-informed people that I've I've heard talking about uh, this stuff in, in any leftist circle. So you can't go wrong uh, with Anarcho Pack slash Zoe Baker. Uh, you can check her out. Uh, and so then before I go, I just want to give you uh, my links again. If you just go to my link tree, I am at Bread Theory there. Um, and you can see my Twitch, my YouTube. I have added my podcast link because I now have a podcast. It's the, the edited audio of, of these streams. Um, and it's, it's by the same name, Bread Theory. You can find it. It's on Anchor. And then it gets distributed to a bunch of different sites. I'll show you that right now. Uh, Pod News. That's another one I'd like you guys to check out. Pod News. If you want to know about any sort of podcaster, Pod News is the place to go. Because no matter what platform you have, they will have links to it. And these are all auto-generated. Um, so here's my podcast, Bread Theory. And I am now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, as well as a whole bunch of others. And these are all just, you, you upload, Anchor is a great resource. You upload to Anchor and it automatically acts as your distributor, goes to iTunes, to all these, these smaller ones, um, uh, as, as well as the bigger ones like Spotify and Google Podcasts and all that sort of thing. Um, so no matter which podcasting platform you use, you're guaranteed to find some good leftist content that's available uh, on whatever whatever platform you use. So I can't recommend highly enough uh, Pod News. That's Anytime you hear about a podcast, go there first, and you'll find a good link that you can use for your podcast player. And then... So going back to my, my links, yep, got all my different stuff. You can buy my art. I'm on Society6. I do nature photography. Uh, and that gets put onto various products that you can purchase. Everything from cell phone covers to clocks to mugs to yoga mats to art prints. Um, and that's that's the best way right now to support, to support my work. Um, until I get to the, the point where I can start having subscribers and stuff like that. This is the best way to uh, give me a little bit of money as, as a thanks for what I do. 
and at the same time get a, a cool product. And I've bought from them as well. They, they make high quality products. Uh, so it's like you put your art on there and it's made to order. As soon as someone orders it, they will manufacture it and send it up to you real fast. And I got a whole bunch of different stuff. I think I have something like 30 or 40 designs on there now. I will add a bunch more um, as I get the time. So once again, Society6 slash Zach Ellsworth Photography. And that will get you to where you need to go. So other than that, I think I'm going to end the stream right now. I'm going to find a channel to raid you to. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with raiding, I'm going to find someone that I follow who happens to be streaming right now, and I'm going to send you to them. And that gives them a little boost, but then it also, you know, if they're aware of, of the raid, they'll say, oh, hey, look at, Look at Bread Theory just rated, rated us. Why don't you go check out their work? And it's a way to kind of help um, different channels support each other, basically. And you get to learn about a new Twitch channel at the same time. So that's pretty cool in my opinion. So I'm going to go ahead and try and find out who is on right now because it's not showing me any of the uh, smaller channels. And I always like to raid a smaller channel to start with. Um, just to give a boost to small but worthy creators, I think. Dirtbag is one that is a guy that I like a lot, so I think I'll raid you into that one. Uh, until next time, friends, uh, Lectan.